Well, ho, 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 and Merry Christmas to all. Thank you so much for joining us on this very special Christmas edition of Mysterious Library here on the Untold Radio Network. Today, keeping in the spirit of the season, we're going to be talking about the recent discovery, which was covered in articles in several periodicals, of what is said to be the original tomb of St. Nicholas. I guess there was only one tomb, so the tomb of St. Nicholas, although I'm sure we'll discuss this tonight on the show. I don't think there ever was a tomb, and I think Santa just went to the North Pole where he lives happily to this day. But that's what we'll be talking about tonight on Mysterious Library. And welcome to Mysterious Library. Yes, tonight, you know, we're going to be talking about Santa Claus, uh, Saint Nicholas. You know, the the bearded one. Uh, again, just sort of an interesting thing that happened uh, recently, archaeologically speaking. I'm a big fan of it, uh, and it's going to give us a lot of room to sort of talk about some things I didn't honestly know about. You know, Saint Nicholas. Um, but before we get into all that. And let's be honest, we're probably not going to stay on topic that long. <laughs> it's going to, at no point am I, did I think that we we're going to go longer than 20 minutes on this subject? And it's, and I have no idea where we're going to go after that. Chaos will ensue. Hilarity no will, will absolutely be the reign of the day. So it's, it's a Christmas episode. We're going to have fun. But before I do that, um, something, ha I watched a movie on Saturday. I've talked about this a lot and it is. It is insane. We I just saw a movie over the weekend. So I just so to preface this, my son, who's 14, my youngest, we finally, you know, sat down and watched uh The Fifth Element. I love that movie, right? That movie, my wife didn't pick the next movie because we were just, you know, doing things, whatever. It was called The Electric Life of Louis Wayne or Louis Wayne, depending on how you want to say it. Benedict Cumberbatch was an, uh, uh, he was an executive producer and he starred in this story about an artist who painted cats. Okay. This movie was, it was more insane than the fifth element. The fifth element by comparison was tame. And when I say crazy, I mean, as a film guy, you're going to get this probably more than a lot of other people. The format of the film okay at first i swear to everyone on this channel i thought i was watching a made like some low budget made for tv movie at the very early, like late 90s early 2000s was like cumberbach when he was a child like when he was just really really young he just kind of looked older i swear that's what i thought i was watching for, because it's formatted like an old school tube television that's the format it's filmed in. It it has the just, but like it's very, 
like it feels like a really like maybe high budget sort of bbc made for tv historical film and the people were you know whoever was behind it you know the director was trying to push some they have they have uh uh when the words come up uh on the screen uh captions close captioning they have close captioning that pops up from time to time and it's in a it's 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 like that old school black bar white block text right like it's again early 90s and they're just ty- teletyping it in it is the most insane movie i have ever seen in my life and i'm sitting here you know i mean not maybe like fritz the cat crazy but i mean like it's really nuts this movie i'm not necessarily recommending it but if you're just like i want to watch something crazy about a man who actually did kind of change culture with cartoons oh so i th- when you said he painted cats i was wondering did he did he dip the cats in paint or did he throw paint on the cats but he actually illustrated cats in many yeah he, yeah he illustrated cats in many ways that may have actually been more sane than what he ended up doing um again it, no big reveal like it's a very sad story like if like it's a really this dude had a hard life it was you know by the time you're done with it you you feel really bad for this guy but apparently i didn't realize this cats being owned as pets was like a taboo thing up until the late 18 you know 19th early 20th centuries and a lot of it was this guy his artwork and cartoons and things like that. his illustrations changed people's opinions about cat owning as a as pets like i didn't realize that this was a thing but man one of the things they go into some deep detail in is how nuts this guy was like his thought at first i was thinking oh, of course my do- my dog does not like me talking about uh cats, cats makes favorably. sense yeah. um but i mean here's where it gets really weird right at first, I'm like, maybe this is whole thing's made up. And then he starts talking about his ideas about electricity and cats and all. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> this is, this is a, no, this guy has to be real. They couldn't have, you couldn't have thought this up if you wanted because it's so crazy. It's like that had to come out of that time period. Like a lot of people don't know a lot of the crazy, weird ideas um, uh, around that time about a lot of things. And it's like, you, no one would have been able to write those ideas from the, because it would never cross our minds that he, that someone would think this. Right. And so these were really what he thought it's, we may actually do the movie as a review and like take it down only because it really did. Like when we're hearing him talk about his, his, you know, his thoughts about electricity and positive and negative um, currents and how it affects us and his connection to spiritism and, and how it affects cats how it no seriously i'm not kidding how it affects cats it really got me thinking about some of the things we talk about today right because we're the modern ones we're sophisticated we know about quantum mechanics right all of the things that we talk about um and it's yeah thank you yes okay horse like it is like you're done watching the movie you're like what did i just watch like what is happening here um so yeah uh, we may have to do it just to talk about like today's like our perspective on science and 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 things like that because when you hear him it's preposterous at first but it's like you know what he's not saying anything different from what a lot of people are saying today just we're using different techno jargon is all it's it's a weird movie it's called the electric life of uh lewis wayne and it's on we found it on uh amazon it's it's weird it's real weird it's all that's all i can say but if you want to if you want to feel depressed and some and watch something weird for like an hour and a half two hours that's your movie oh can i can i feel please please feel depressed for an hour and a half yes can you feel <laughs> yeah yeah if you want to feel depressed for an hour and a half or two hours i forget how long the movie is and 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 watch cats watch cats that eventually get um electrocuted no well oh, okay. no i mean That's sort good. of but not really uh Yikes. there are there's a point in the movie where like you said throughout the movie those sort of uh old school uh closed caption boxes pop up with text right and it just 
slow, you know, just randomly for different reasons. At a certain point, though, they start throwing them in for the cats. Like the cats are talking. And they're, they throw them up there. It, it, and it's, it only happens sporadically. It doesn't continue throughout the entire movie from that point, but it does pop up from time to time. And you're like, wait, are the cats talking? Like, that's literally, they start doing that. Like, it, again, the movie's weird. Like, again, a Luc Besson sci-fi movie seems more cl- more rational than this thing. Like, I, that's how nuts this movie is. Can you remember that 80s popular book like uh, uh just a book with funny illustrations i think it was called like 101 uses for a dead cat or something yes yes like i do cultural phenomenon yes. i don't know i think that'd yeah. be politically incorrect now i can't imagine bookstores across the country having and they used to always be like in really yeah. prevalent or prominent places like it used to be yeah. like on the counter or next to the counter they just sold these yes. things like a tobacco and a sell cigarettes mm-hmm. but they was flying off the shelf yeah no, I remember that one. Yeah, it was again the fifth element made way more sense than this movie. That's all I can say. That's how crazy this thing is. So it can make for crazy. Yeah. Yes, they can. Well, it like I said, it's an interesting film. That's all I can say. Hmm. We, we got like cat. I said, we have to we have to review it just to have that conversation. Oh, we will. My poor cat's suffering in the winter here because he's a barn cat. So I let oh, him in my attached yeah. garage and I have a little heating pad. And he's mm-hmm. a cat who in the summer is gone for like, you know, he'll go for 24 hours. He just goes on adventures yeah. and hunting. And But in the winter, man, he don't go nowhere. He just curls up in there and just like comes out, looks around, goes straight back in. Yeah. I'm like, nope, not this cat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Sp- I get it. Sp- speaking of books and other I suppose media that we're not reviewing tonight, or we're not talking about directly like we will when we get to these articles on the discovery of the tomb of St. Nicholas or the alleged tomb of St. Nicholas. I have a fresh off the presses for us and it's like totally fresh. Like I think it's only like shipping. I think you can order it. It's just shipping now. Like it's, I haven't got my copy yet. I've ordered it, but it hasn't arrived because I think I bought a pre-order. Anyway, Mm -hmm. that is the wonderful Chad Lewis's most recent book, Winter Legends and Lore, which looks at all kinds of strange winter traditions and weird Mm -hmm. Christmas beliefs that we don't necessarily really follow anymore and Chad's a wonderful guest and this is also a plug for talking weird this Saturday night this Christmas Eve Chad Ah. Lewis is my guest and we'll be talking about that book and about all kinds of weird and wonderful Mm -hmm. strange traditions which used to take place and some still do around the Christmas season so people want to spend Christmas Eve with me they're more than welcome to jump on and watch me chat to Chad and say hi in the chat or whatever else yeah, it sounds like fun. But a good, I'm sure it's going to be a good book. I don't have it yet. I've got a bunch yeah. of Chad's books. They're always great. So I can't wait till this one arrives. And I think it would be a yeah. really cool book to read at this time of the year when half of the country is about to be buried in the buried coldest in Christmas snow. in 40 years, right? They're saying that's yeah. what I'm hearing. Coldest Christmas in 40 years. So I hope mine gets here in the next day or two so I can like kind of just hunker down and drink my eggnog and sit by my fire and read weird Christmas traditions. There you go love it um i have to admit i am really sort of intrigued by that because like we when we did our our thing about uh halloween right the halloween book where there was all those weird sort of traditions and ideas that were that we just don't usually partake of anymore um i i kind of like to see like what are some of these other traditions out there were these other thoughts about you know winter traditions and christmas traditions that are not common i mean and and i think you know like krampus the idea of krampus that's had a bit of resurgence over the last 20 years or so people becoming aware of that uh from you know more eastern european traditions but there's all other all kinds of these other ideas and thoughts running around that i think that'd be a really fun book to read oh yeah i can't wait to read it and i'm fascinated by those older traditions which we've lost including the ones like you mentioned on halloween and how a lot of it's been sanitized and just commercialized now and the meaning and the significance and the older traditions Mm -hmm. are gone but christmas was very similar i mean without going down that 
route too far now because I'm going to do it with Chad on Saturday yep. night. But things like ghost stories at Christmas used oh, to yeah. be a big tradition. I mean, the most mm -hmm. famous Christmas book ever written, obviously, other than the Bible, is probably Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. And that's a yeah. ghost story from Victorian England about, about Christmas time. And this wasn't the only ghost story written. Nope about Christmas. There were lots yeah. of them. It was a tradition that you'd sit around and tell ghost stories at Christmas time. Who does uh, that today? Well, exactly. I was even, I was actually just thinking about this the other day. Uh, there's, what did it, uh, I forget the name of the song, you know, cause you have all the Christmas songs on the radio now. Oh yeah. And we'll tell scary a, stories or yeah, something like that. Yeah. Goes, yeah, however it yeah goes, scary right? ghost stories scary and ghost tales stories, of the glories of Christmas is long. Exactly. Long ago. It's like right there. The idea that uh, that w there were like telling ghost stories over Christmas was a thing because you're right. Uh, and again, we'll let you say that with Chad, but you know, Charles Dickens's uh, A Christmas Carol. It's not just that it's a ghost story. In many ways, it shapes and creates the modern Christmas. Like people don't really understand how much of what our what we consider to be a traditional Christmas literally was created by charles dickens's book that story reshapes our views on a, on the christmas holidays so again it's going to be a great show so this saturday here on untold radio talking weird it's going to be a great show thank you yeah i'm looking really forward to it. it's interesting when you mentioned that song too i'd forgotten about that mm -hmm. myself but that's a song like from the 50s or 60s right so people were still yeah. or maybe the 40s anyway it's from living memory of some people like it's not right. a song which is a 1920 song or 1890 song yeah um I'm, i think it's a fair like it certainly was probably written in my parents lifetime mm -hmm. or lifetime so it's it goes to show that we were still sitting around telling ghost stories or at least it was a recognizable enough cultural trope back then that it was included in a major holiday song yeah uh hold on i gotta look it up because now yeah, i gotta no. know yeah, yeah, pull it up. Uh, so, pull it up it's so the most wonderful it time of the year. Uh, do, 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 here, Smithsonian. I think maybe the, uh, maybe the forties at the latest, or maybe the late thirties, yeah. somewhere between the late thirties and sixties. I would well, it'd be earlier than the sixties, late thirties and fifties. I would imagine. Right? Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. And late thirties, yeah. it sounds a little too poppy for. So I'm guessing later. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, most versions are from 1963. Andy the, Williams's there song. There you go. Yeah. It's heaps recent, then. Yeah, that's yeah. I I would have thought it was even earlier than that, but yeah, that's 1963. Yeah, Texas Jack was yeah. saying that as well. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. So apparently, it's yeah. That's that's a thing that was at least in, even if people weren't necessarily doing it at the time, they remembered that that was a thing that was that was happening. So there you go. Interesting. And I think, I'm I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to this show. I really oh, thank am. You. That'd be fun. Yeah, come and, like I said, grab a, I don't know, do you drink eggnog? Is eggnog a thing in the McLean house? Not really. I it's mean, a thing here, man. I love yeah. I that. I used to make fake eggnog in Australia, like just with creamy mm -hmm. liqueurs and things and milk. But here in America, you can buy eggnog on the shelf. You don't have to work oh, yeah. out how to kind of make it. Yourself. I know there's a proper way to make it with eggs and other things, but I didn't know that in Sydney. And I always used to see the movies. So at Christmas right. time, when I became of age, I used to go, I'll get, you know, a liqueur and mix it with some milk and put some other things in and mm -hmm. make an eggnoggy drink. I knew it was just a creamy thing. Here I just go to Walmart and in the <laughs> cool good section, oh, I'll buy, you know, a gallon yep. of eggnog and I'm set for the season. I've never been a fan of eggnog and I'm not a big oh. drinker, so there's just not a lot there for Oh, me. you don't have to put liquor in it. You can drink oh, it I just know. like I, as a that's creamy saying, Christmas drink. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't like eggnog and I'm not a big drinker. So like, I just don't, like, there's literally nothing there for me. I'm like... It's just, eh, I would rather have pumpkin pie and milk. That sounds good, too. Is that what you now, leave I, out for? Is that what you no. leave out for old St. Nick, who we're about to get to in the McLean house? Or does he get yes. pumpkin pie instead of cookies? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Bishop uh, Nicholas will be getting milk and pumpkin pie this year. Is, it, is that how he's referred to? Yes. And kids uh, to bed. Yeah. Bishop Nicholas is on his way. Bishop Nicholas is on his way. <laughs> And I always leave out a, a nice pair of brass knuckles for him because he's got some Aryans to beat. That's all I'm saying. Well, supposedly, I mean, something happened at Nicaea. There is some debate. We we, we shouldn't yeah. get too bogged down this, but there's debate whether he was at Nicaea or not because some historical 
right. lists say he was at Nicaea and some yep. he's left out of. So it is a historical debate. Of course, we're talking now about St. Nicholas, the precursor to Santa Claus, or perhaps Santa Claus himself. And maybe you want to do the overview, because this was your suggestion that we were yeah. going to look at these articles. It was a great idea, perfect for the Christmas season. Yeah, so... So what happened is uh, just a little background. So St. Nicholas was a, he was a bishop. Uh, actually, I have to, because there's a lot of names and I'm terrible with names. So uh, let me make certain. So he was a bishop and in the, in the early church, he was in, imprisoned by Diocletian uh, and he was released under uh, Constantine. And to uh, Dean's point, he was, there are some lists of the people who attended the Council of Nicaea. Some believe he was there, others not. And he, that wasn't the only one. The thing is, nobody wrote about him saying or doing anything really of, of import. So there was debate as to whether or not he was there, uh, you know, in any meaningful capacity. But there's a story of him getting into a fight with Arius. In fact, there's a claim that he was defrocked for a time because... <laughs> It depends on who's writing the story. He either full on decks Arius, uh, or he just slaps him across the face. Um, for those of you who don't know, Arius was again another bishop of the time, and there in and he uh, is classically now considered a heretic because of his views on the Trinity. Uh, not to get too far afield in the subject, but essentially he believed that the logos, the Word, which is Jesus. Uh, was was uh, not co necessarily co existent with the Father. Uh, Trinitarian says Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Different positions, but they were all co equal in that they all, you know, there was never a time where they when all three of them did not exist. Arianism though says no, the Logos does come and there was a come from the Father, and that there was a time when that was not in existence. When he did not exist so that's called that's sort of the arian um uh, her, uh heresy and so it is claimed that he again assaulted arius during a debate and it's it has led to many memes that i find infinitely enjoyable um but that's that's sort of a story so famously he is known as the miracle as a as a wonder worker and he's most noted for being you know he was born uh, in Turkey, uh, he was the child. He was the child of some rather wealthy uh, uh, merchants. Uh, his parents died, and he dedicates his life to helping and serving the poor. He sells everything they have, and uh, he's mo one of his most famous acts of charity was uh, providing dowries for these three sisters so they wouldn't be forced into a life of prostitution. We have to remember during this time, Christianity was illegal and was under great persecution by the Roman uh, by the Roman hierarchy, and so a lot of Christians that you know they were they were dying, and so he he was he spent everything that he had and gave and gave his life over to uh, tending to the needs of others. He is one of the most beloved saints in all of Europe. In fact, there are more Catholic churches named after him than even Mary the mother of christ so it's what he's he's a very very famous uh saint and he's one of the most beloved of all saints uh even the catholic saints and so that's the preface here's the part of the story i wasn't aware of okay so again you know he's in turkey he's yeah you know, he does you know there, there are claims that he went to egypt for a time and uh went to the levant for a time to you know on different pilgrimages but he basically served in turkey and he was entombed there there was however i want to get the date here right uh so in, during the 11th century uh, apparently there was this there was some uh fight there's some fighting going on and some italian merchants in the year 1087 supposedly robbed his tomb and took his remains to the city of Bari. Uh, in Italy, in Italy, and put his stuff on, and put his, you know, his uh, his relics, with meaning his bones, on display, and he's, which is why he's also known as the Saint of Barry. So for the last thousand years, supposedly he his remains have actually been in Italy, not in Turkey, where he was interred. Mm -hmm. However, 
However, in 2017, they discovered that the, there was a church that was dedicated. The, it was actually the church that he served at um, in uh, in Myra. Uh, in, in it's now currently, um, oh, what is it called now? Uh, it's, hold on, uh, it's, darn, I just had it, uh, D uh, Demri, Demri, Turkey. So that's the current name, but it was Myra at the time. The church where he served at um, had been rebuilt several times uh, in the Byzantine style. Well, while they were working on it, they discovered a secondary floor much lower down. And they realized that that was the original church. That was the foundation for the original church upon which he, you know, that his tomb was built. So they've been going down into it and they believe, and this is sort of the conclusion that they're coming to, he's still buried there. That this, the, uh, the stealing of his, of his remains by these Italian merchants in 1087, they grabbed the wrong corpse. It was apparently some other random, uh, uh, you know, priest, a lesser priest who had, uh, worked there they stole his body not saint nicholas's oh saint so, nicholas wasn't there to be found man he'd like jumped on those reindeer pfft, cut out a dodge to the north pole where he still is christmas elk that's a whole other joke no one's i'll explain that joke later but yeah no he so yeah it looks like we've actually found the real tomb of saint nicholas he's there he the italians uh the the italian merchants missed him and they got somebody else so, so the last thousand years people have been venerating the wrong the wrong uh bishop apparently and those merchants made bank out of that as well like oh, their yeah, families did. became some mm -hmm. of the most significant richest and most powerful mm -hmm. members of the community back in italy where they took his dem bones dem bones because mm -hmm. it brought such esteem and such tourist trade mm -hmm. to the area that they essentially were able to write their own check yeah oh exactly well, that's but that's how everything worked back then right uh, you get something, you bring it back, it becomes a tourist attraction. I think someone said there was enough wood from all of these supposed, you know, pieces of the true cross that are on display in different Catholic churches that you could build a boat out of them. So, I mean, relics are, relics were big money yeah. in the day. I mean, they were, they were big. And of course, um, during the crusades, some of those relics were, uh, were taken from Italy to other places because they got raided. Uh, by other, by other Catholics. Um, well, even when, so. even when the Italians moved in and snagged the apparently wrong body, mm -hmm. that yeah. was because the, essentially the Ottoman empire was just bearing down oh, yeah. all of that. Most of the locals from what was part of, which was part mm -hmm. of the Eastern Roman empire, but they were essentially Greeks. They just fled rightfully so, mm -hmm. because, you oh, know, yeah. there's the, these vicious and angry and militarily successful army is bearing down on them. And so I think what yep. kind of happened is mm -hmm. those traders were like, this is our opportunity. Let's get oh, in yeah. there now. It's like kind of Kelly's heroes, you know, <laughs> World yeah. War II movie no, you're not wrong. where everything's in a ray. Yeah. So you roll in and mm -hmm. you grab the gold. It was kind of that scenario. Fascinating. They could make a movie out of it. I mean, a fascinating story. Oh, it really is. Well, and to your point, I think this is, this is where we kind of need to have a little sympathy for people. It's like, yeah, they made bank, right? And that's always a part of the math. However, to your point, the Islamic uh, caliphate that was just tearing up at the time was not kind to other religious uh, institutions, their buildings, things like that. Um, we tend to forget, again, because we're, again, you know, most people look at history, they look at European history. They don't really take into the account so a lot of the things that happened with uh, with the Ottoman Caliphate. And the Ottoman Empire didn't collapse until the end of World War One. Like this is this again, pretty as uh, Westerners, we tend to forget how much uh, the Ottoman Caliphate just messed with Europe. I mean, at one yeah. point, this is why Charlemagne was so important was that he actually led a revolt against the, against the Islamic invaders. They made it all the way to France. 
Yeah, like they were was, they yeah. were raiding stuff in France and he drove them out. Char Charles the Hammer dropped the hammer and battled yes. the sewer and stopped mm -hmm. it there and then. But this is something you're right, which isn't talked about. I've often heard mm -hmm. academics talk about how horrible the crusaders were going into the Holy Land. There were mm -hmm. a few minor incursions by Western forces into what it was Jerusalem. There yeah. was wave after wave after wave after wave of Islamic invasion and Islamic oh, yeah. military attacks on Europe. So much so that, yeah, they'd, take, they'd taken all of Spain. They took all of what's now Turkey because back then it was the Eastern was Greece. Roman yeah. Empire. Yeah, right. And they... They, as you said, they went all the way up into France, and it was it was mm -hmm. only they were stopped there. So there wasn't just a couple of kind of weak loserish incursions like the Crusades were, which were pretty much ineffectual to be honest. Yeah, the Islamic conquests of Europe were very successful, and they you can watch those type of time maps. You could find one online which just shows the mm -hmm. invasions, and it's just phenomenal how oh, yeah. much incursion there was into European lands by the caliphate like you were saying but it's oh, not yeah. what's normally taught we're taught oh you know the, i can remember when george w bush made the faux pas after 9 11 and mm -hmm. saying this is going to be another crusade and they were like oh the people in that part of the world they have a long memory you say crusade and they're really offended by it and i'm thinking and i'm an historian so i know i'm thinking excuse me the yeah. Crusades were nothing compared to the to, compared to the caliphate the islamic invasions of europe they were a blip yeah, and for just to give people an idea of how impactful um, and, and and dedicated these the Islamic Caliphate was trying to get into Europe, Spain went back and forth between European control and Islamic control for so long that one third of all Spanish words are derived from Arabic. And when people talk about how the Spanish behaved in in Latin America when they when they came to the New World. You have to understand that is exactly what they were doing was what had happened to them from the Islamic invasions, um, converting, you know, uh, previous religious institutions and, you know, in, you know, from uh, the Aztec or the Mayan to churches and using those stones. That's actually antithetical to Christianity, uh, particularly from the Old Testament it actually says not to do that. But that's what the Muslims did when they they would they were their practice was to take. Christian churches and uh, they do the same. They did the same thing in India and and everywhere else, but they would then convert them into mosques. So much of what we see happening in South America was because of, that was what the Muslims did to them. It changed their language. It changed dramatically, and it changed their philosophy. The idea of holy war is actually not a native Christian ideal. They adopted that from seven hundred years of being the the sort of frontier between uh, the Islamic invasion and Europe. And basically providing a buffer because once Charlemagne got them out, you know, they sort of provided that buffer. So back to the broader point here, it's easy to look at those Italian merchants saying, Hey, let's get, you know, let's get St. Nicholas out of here as a money grab. And that's definitely part of the math, but we also have to remember they're looking at the, they're looking at what's going on saying, we should probably get this beloved saint to someplace safe. Right. Uh, again, they are Catholic at this time, so it's going to be you know closer to the Catholic Church where they can be where it can be where he can be protected. They venerated him. Again, there are, even to this day there are more Catholic churches named after Saint Nicholas than after even Mary herself. So he's an important figure, and this is what they were trying to do. There needs to be a little compassion for that. Problem is, they screwed up and they got the wrong and they got the wrong guy. Well, like so. I said, that's because old Saint Nick got the deck, you know. Got mm -hmm. the devil out of there on the back of that reindeer. But speaking of that mixture of tri of Christian and pagan tradition when it comes to Santa Claus, Nancy mm -hmm. Malcolm asks, isn't the legend of St. Nick based on Odin? Well, I don't think it's so much that it's based on Odin. I think that there are a marrying of various cultural mm -hmm. traditions. So as Jason was saying earlier, the fact that St. Nicholas was well known to be very generous and that he would you know, mm -hmm. do things like save women from prostitution or he would, you know, give gifts to the poor or, you know, these things mm -hmm. began to become part of a Christmas Christian tradition, mm -hmm. but it blended with things like the hat I'm wearing now, which looks in many ways 
more like what we associate a man of the woods wearing a furry kind of hat or like an elf might wear but even the red and white of this hat is because that was what was associated with in iconography with St. Mm -hmm. Nicholas. St. Nicholas would be painted in a red and white outfit. Yeah. So if you look Mm -hmm. at the artwork for this show, the thumbnail for this show, you, if you're Mm -hmm. watching it now on YouTube or on Facebook or wherever you might, if you watch it later, or if you're listening to it, you can probably find the thumbnail anyway. You don't even have to look at that. You can look anywhere. All depictions of St. Nicholas in the mm-hmm. Catholic Church, his iconography was red and white, and saints would have things which they would be traditionally painted in every picture as wearing or carrying or with symbols. Mm-hmm. For example, he was often also drawn with three gold discs, which yeah. represented either the three bags of gold or the three gold spheres he was meant to throw through the house you were talking about before, throw through the window right. of the house where the daughters were going to be forced into prostitution. And it was yes. he threw that in and it saved them from prostitution. So one of his symbols was three gold discs, but certainly the red and mm-hmm. white costuming of santa is part of what saint nicholas was traditionally depicted as wearing but again Mm -hmm. yes you can see those that northern or nordic kind of you know cold weather fur man of the woods as well and and along with it looks an awful lot like the way that elves are depicted or gnomes are depicted or sometimes fairies are depicted and as we were talking about a song recently which talked about christmas ghost stories but of Mm -hmm. course a visit from saint nicholas or the night before christmas has him spoken of as a right jolly old elf right and he's little and the reindeer are little and it clearly seems to be part of yep that type of pagan or fairy tradition, the very fact he's referred to as an elf and that he, he lives in the north, in, in, you know, the far north and he has lots of little elves who help him. And he has a sleigh, which is pulled by reindeer. All of these things fit into that kind of, that, yeah. those, that pagan symbology, which I think Nancy's referring to. No. And that's, that's a great point. In fact, even the name Santa Claus, right. Is, a, is derived from St. Nicholas because it's the Dutch version. It's a, it's actually a Dutch nickname of saint it's saint nicholas sinterklaas is is essentially their sort of na- was their nickname for saint nicholas again what we have is a lot of merging of uh of history and into popular zeit into the popular zeitgeist and mythology and i think this is this is one of those topics where people on all sides of the of the aisle kind of get i think mixed up right because in truth, Christmas is a, it's not a, it's actually more of a secular holiday than it is a religious holiday, right? The words Christmas comes from Christ's mass. It, there was a mass held on December 25th um, for him. And actually that date, I know every, ugh, the internet, I love it because we're here, but then you have, you have some really weird ideas. Anyway, the, the, the December 25th date actually comes from the first couple centuries of Christianity because they're trying to figure out when Jesus was born, right? Um, and uh, Origen, um, oh, Eusebius, and a few others calculated his birthday to December 25th and the way they did it. Now, I disagree with it, and, and there's a whole... I'll do an episode on... Actually, the episode tomorrow I'm doing is when do I think Jesus was actually born? I have, a, And I'll show the reasoning for it. But... <clears throat> what they did was they said, okay, we believe that when, that, uh, when John the Baptist, right, his father sees the angel, he's, he's in there doing his service because he's a high priest. Well, they said, okay, well, we know about the right time that for that to have occurred. They said, well, if it happened in, you know, zero AD or one AD, then it happened on this date. And then if, when Mary, who is now pregnant, comes to uh, uh comes to her cousins uh elizabeth who is pregnant with with john and john jumps they said okay well that was six that happened six months later right um and so they that's how they did the calculations right this okay so essentially jesus is six months younger than john the baptist that that was their and which is what brings them to december 25th right that's sort of how they got those numbers i would disagree with it but essentially that's what it was you know the, the, so the the catholic church said okay well, well we'll do something for jesus it's a it's a winter it's a winter date this is what everyone thought he was born 
we'll do something for him. But it was just a mess. It was just, that's all it was, right? So the thing is, though, it, it became a secular holiday as well. Because people were having fun. It was a time to throw parties. And, the act, and only the actual religious would celebrate it, would celebrate that aspect of it. Uh, this is why you get so many weird carols where it's like, um, oh, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Well, when you get into the second verse of that song, it says, bring us figgy pudding, bring it right now. Like, who's the, who's running around demanding figgy pudding? We right? used to have, you know, my mother always cooked pudding in Australia. Fruit pudding, mm -hmm. same thing. It's an English thing. We don't really do it here yeah. in the U.S. No, we don't. Yeah. But the, but the point is, like, if you listen to, if you let that song go on, they're going to bust into your house and steal your figgy pudding. Like, what kind of Christmas carol is this? Which goes back to my point about how Charles Dickens really reshaped how we think about Christmas. And how it's like Christmas Halloween, too, to your other point. There's a commonality with Halloween. Yes. The idea of going door to door with sailing or caroling is very much like trick or treating. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it was, again, it was a secular holiday. It, it just was. And so you have a lot because you have religious holiday, you have the secular holiday growing up around it. Things interact, right? There's this sort of amalgamation of ideas and yeah, stuff from the Fae, stuff from the elves that you can say, well, this stuff kind of looks like Odin. Um, and then you have, you have the Coca-Cola company hopping in, right? And in, in creating what we think of as Santa Claus today, again, how we view Santa Claus in the West is literally born out of Coca-Cola merchandise from the thirties. Like that's it. I mean, that's, and again, why red and white also, because it's, it's a Coca-Cola Coca logo. I, I think they real. I think Coca-Cola realized mm -hmm. the significance. I mean, you're right. Coke is responsible for the Santa as we have him today, but there are pre obviously Coca-Cola images, of even course. from England with oh, of course. him wearing things like this, but a longer coat or, you know, yeah. a slightly, mm -hmm. maybe mightn't be as plump. He might be taller or he mightn't have that classic modern Americana Santa yeah. image, which is now mm -hmm. what anybody even growing up in Australia knew Santa as, but the, the father Christmas illustrations before then, for example, were paving the way. St. Nicholas himself was paving the way. Odin was paving the way. But you're right. The Santa today is in many ways mm -hmm. the Coca-Cola Santa. Yeah. Visually, I mean, anyway. Visually. Well, and here's the thing. Like, we think of him as red and white. And again, for good reason, right, uh, with a lot of that iconography. However, um, green and gold are also a very popular color for him. And we see that a lot of the, again, your more Eastern uh, Orthodox traditions have him as green and gold as his num as his color. So there's a, again, there's a lot of interesting questions around them. And again, we often see him in a miter cap um, as well because he was a he was a bishop. So yeah, I mean, it, it's just it, you know, finding his tomb is just one of those excuses to kind of go through and look at how we go from a bishop who liked to pimp slap heretics and rescue women from prostitution into being a jolly old elf who takes, who, who brings tangerines and gifts to good children and coal to bad children. That's true. There's a, there is a fascinating poetical or, or poetical lyrical aspect to it as well. Of course, if he truly was the defender of Trinitarianism mm -hmm. at Nicaea, if he was this person who, did Christ-like miracles because he was also one of the first, yeah. he's a saint of many things, but one of the things he's saint of is of sailors, right? Because he supposedly did the Christ-like yes. thing, you know, stop the storm. Yeah. If that figure, the most popular saint mm -hmm. in the olden, you know, the olden Roman church and still probably today, as you were saying, he's so venerated. The fact that he becomes in many ways the, symbol of western christmas time yeah there is something there is something quite poetic about it i mean the idea that this man who was mm -hmm. allegedly this great christian and this great supporter of the of the christian faith ends up becoming the person that people identify with christmas yeah I mean, it, it's kind of nice. Now, of course, we all know the reason for the season, and it's Christ that isn't Santa. But, I mean, I think a lot of Christians get a little bit upset about Santa. I don't. I, I think 
the fact that this that, that this holiday remains the most important holiday in the Western calendar for even those of us who might not, or the the people who might not be religious at all. The mm -hmm. fact that we still say Merry Christmas, the fact that we still have this idea of the importance of giving and the importance of family and that the date, even though, as you were saying, probably yeah. isn't the real date of Christ, it's the date of the birth, the, the birth date of Christ. It certainly for a long time was thought of as that. So I think the whole Santa thing is culturally, it's a great thing. I'm all oh, yeah. about Santa. Yeah. To your point, I think, you know, we can easily point to the the commercialization of christmas as almost you know as and, and the way santa claus is is portrayed again as a secular idea is as being this very disrespectful to saint nicholas and and to the hall and to the the holiday but i tend to take a, a different view because like you i see the even among those who are non-religious during christmas the idea of generosity of giving caring is very very popular and again being as a being together as a family like these are these are ideals that i think uh he would have championed and 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 even if it's just you know there's all this stuff thrown on top of it there is something to, to be said for just for just the, the entire world kind of taking a moment to say can we just be nice to, to each other for just a little bit of time can we think about somebody else you know in in giving you know, in charity for just a little bit of time. It's, you know, I do think the world would be a better place if Christmas came every day, right? And that if that if that mentality was an every year thing, but I understand that, you know, a lot of people, you know, it's not going to happen. But for just a little time of year, for just a little fraction, there's this time when people say, I should, I should drop some money in that bucket or I should give to someone in need. I should have a little bit of charity. I should think about my family. Yeah, it, it, it's it, unfortunately commercialization, all that. Yeah, absolutely true. But it, just even that little piece is, I think, my why I appreciate Christmas. Um, you know, re regardless of your view overall, but you know, et cetera, just just that little piece, I think, is worth it. Where it's like, hey, we can love, we can love each other, right? Uh, I've heard the Christmas going back to the idea of the Christmas Carol. Uh, from from Dickens, like I said, it really radically. People don't understand how radically it shifted our view on Christmas, right? It really is come comes from. I heard someone recently say that they believe the Christmas Carol is the fifth gospel, and I th I've thought about it. like it's been in my head since I heard this. It was a couple weeks ago. I'm like, you know, he's not wrong when he says that because the entire premise of the story is someone going is someone who is living only and exclusively for themselves right um and their um you know their desires their wealth and learning to give right not in fact he starts off you know the, the everyone you know the, the the famous line of are there no poor houses are are there no work houses are there no prisons that's him saying isn't the government taking care of these people? And instead, he learns at the end that he himself has to be the one to give and care about his fellow man. Uh, Marley was dead to begin with. What is Marley's whole point? He's like, my business was humanity. I'm blowing the line here. But his, he's like, my business was everyone else. It was the people in, in my life. It was the people out there. That was what my business was. It wasn't making money. And I, and in a lot of ways, I think that's a very, that is a very St. Nicholas thing. Yeah. The, the work of Dickens is so central to, I think, the way that we look at Christmas today, that charity aspect of it, mm -hmm. the idea that you should give to perhaps you should let your employees off a little bit earlier on Christmas. You should give them a Christmas bonus. All of these ideas, the idea of a Christmas mm -hmm. bonus, you can probably trace directly to Dickens. Oh, you to can begin with. Yes, absolutely. But I, I feel, I always feel sad. I know how hard Christmas can be for some people. Maybe they've lost a loved one or yes. maybe they're going through a very hard time. Mm -hmm. 
they're not feeling the joy that they feel they're supposed to. I mm-hmm. think there's an awful lot of pressure on people to get presents that they can't afford. There's an awful yes. lot of pressure on people to attend multiple events when they might not be the type of person who feels like attending multiple mm-hmm. events. But I hope everybody who's watching and listening tonight is able to remember the meaning of Christmas, but also, as you were saying, the importance of giving to other people and thinking of others and to recognize that it's meant to be a period, not of pressure, but a period of joy and a period of yes. valuing our fellow mm-hmm. man and a period of enjoying the, the the company of other people and the company of our families. And if mm-hmm. I don't know, I, I, there's no magic bullet. I'm lucky that I'm always just, I've always have been you know, just immersed in the Christmas spirit. I love the holiday so much. And even though I've lost family members that I used to spend it with, and it was such a special time of the year. And even though now I live in a cabin in the woods with just my daughter, I have none of the big Christmases that I used to have when I was in Mm -hmm. Sydney. That joy has stayed with me. And I think if people could, I don't know, if they could just try to forget about the commercialism, forget about the pressure and just remember to, you know, take a breath and to look around and to look at, to take stock of what they can be grateful for, the same way we're meant to do at Thanksgiving and we forget about right. it. But see if maybe there are people around you that you can help. Or if you need help, don't be afraid to ask somebody to say, I'm having a really tough Christmas. Can you help me? Yeah. You know, can you, can, because it's a time where I think yes. people would be responsive more perhaps than any other time of the year. So try Mm -hmm. to, I don't know, try to have a little bit of joy this Christmas, as hard as it can be for people. My heart goes out to those. This is getting a little bit D&M for for Mysterious Library, but it's something I'm conscious of every year because every year I see people, you know, who I can tell are having it hard or people reference people they know who are doing it tough. And I'm like, I just wish that it it could be a day at least where people could just say, I'm not going to worry about anything. I'm going to focus on what matters. I'm going to focus on my family and what I have. And I'm going to try to remember the good things, the blessings in this life. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm right there with you. Completely agree. Completely agree. Um, Cause yeah, there are a lot of people who have it hard, who, you know, this is not an easy time for them. Um, And you know what, like I said, you know, commercialism does take a lot from it and maybe that in the spirit of, of St. Nicholas, maybe there is a cultural change that we need to make to say, you know what, Maybe I don't need another pair of sneakers or, well, actually I probably do all things considered. Um, I've been walking a lot more, but it's like, maybe I don't, (laughs) maybe we don't need to spend money. We don't have on presents that, you know, we've got enough. Absolutely. Maybe maybe everyone, instead of spending money, you don't have, maybe you take 20, everyone takes $20 and you go and you buy goats and chickens for somebody in Africa or in Asia or in Latin America, things that will actually help people who are subsistence farmers, right? Or the poor or person will block over because this country is exactly. loaded with poor people. The whole oh, West yeah. is loaded with poor people. Every, well, everyone's loaded with, with poor people, but again, or maybe you find a family in your area to bless, right? And there's a hundred ways to do this. Um, or ask somebody you actually... know who's alone, ask them to Christmas dinner. I've done that before. Yeah. It could be a fr- it could be mm-hmm. somebody you know well, or it could be somebody you don't know that well. Yeah. It could be somebody, you know, some old guy exactly. who works at the corner store and you know he has no family. Why not say, hey, mm-hmm. Charles, you know, I, I talk to you every week. We've never done anything. You want to come to Christmas dinner? And I bet you mm-hmm. even if he doesn't come, he'll feel good knowing somebody wanted him to come to Christmas dinner. Yeah. My wife's family, I one of the things I really respect about them is when they do they do Christmas during the day, you know, on Christmas Day um international students that that they you know my, my uh father-in-law is a uh, is a professor um he's the only man i know who's gotten accidental degrees um that's a long story honestly but you know they bring people who may not have you know they, they go out of their way to find people for whom they may not have someone to spend the holidays with they bring them in you know it's like no you come into our homes let's let's you know let's let's have you there let's talk let's 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 give you someone to celebrate with you know to your point That's just, I think that's just as meaningful as anything else. Yeah. This pressure, I was talking to somebody only the other day who was feeling an inordinate amount of pressure to buy Mm -hmm. presents they couldn't afford for their family, their extended family. And Mm -hmm. I was like, you don't have to, that isn't what Christmas is about, but that you can afford or not afford 
to buy people presents. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Shame on anybody who makes somebody think that they've got to buy a certain amount of gifts or yeah. buy any gift. Shame on anybody who thinks the person's company isn't gift enough, especially at this time of year. Good, good grief. Yeah. No, exactly. And particularly given the current economic standards. So, yeah, I mean, let's maybe we'd need a little extra, you know, actual St. Nicholas spirit to, you know, let's let's maybe change some traditions here. You know, he was he was looking out for him. He wasn't looking out for himself or just trying to find the nearest trinket. He was trying to make he was trying to help people's lives, people who couldn't afford them. He was, again, saving women from prostitution. Right. He was he was going. This was a man who literally gave he had wealth and gave it up to to help other people at a time and it cost him his freedom for a long time like he was in prison because of what he was doing right let's uh let's maybe take a little little thing from that and you know maybe there's a heretic or two you can pimp slap every once in a while you know in, in that good christmas spirit <laughs> and you know what that's all jokes aside regardless of what ever body is or isn't found in that tomb that's why i don't think mm -hmm the core substance of St. Nicholas or the, the very, the very vital element of Santa Claus has gone. It's what Santa Claus is. And this sounds like something from a Hallmark movie now, but it's true. And this is, might be why I love Christmas so much and why I always feel the spirit of it because to give to other people, not if you can't afford it. And if you can't afford to give something, maybe you can help somebody in some mm -hmm. capacity yep. to, to, to think of other people on that day. That is the spirit of St. Nicholas continuing. That is the spirit of Santa Claus. So Santa Claus is as real as anybody who has a, ever has been, realer than anybody who's ever been in many ways, because the idea that mm -hmm. is encapsulated in his name, the idea of you give to others, that you help people, that we remember that at this holiday, as well as we remember, obviously, the most important part of the holiday, Christ, but that we remember what we can do here on earth, that we can help people, that there was a man who once walked, you know, among us who wasn't just the son of God. There was another man, too, who tried to live up to those ideals and is immortalized yeah. forever with the holiday as well. Yeah, I love it. And again, you know. He's here to bring presents and pimp slap some uh, some heretics. So quickly, um, what are you what are you up to? We should say what what are you up for, to for Christmas before we say goodbye to everybody. Oh, honestly, um, so my family, my side of the family, we do everything on Christmas Eve. Always have. Uh, apparently, it's a Scottish thing. I didn't realize that it was. I just grew up with it. Um, and uh, so you know, I'll be with my family that evening. We'll probably be doing fajitas. Because we're Texans. That's what we do. Um, Fantastic. And then uh, the following day, I will be with uh, my my wife's side of the family because they do theirs during the day. It worked out very, very nicely because like with, with Thanksgiving, you got to try and it's like, well, do I want to go to this Thanksgiving or this Thanksgiving? Right. And you, otherwise you're, you're, you're hopping from one to another. But this one's like, nope, one's in the evening, one's during the day, makes everything real easy. Um, Nothing too serious. Uh, real quick though, uh, Angel Play eight one seven. Uh, I'll actually be addressing that tomorrow on Siri Papers. Uh, when you know when he was actually born, in the date September eleventh does show up there. Um, I, I just don't think he was necessarily born on the day, but it's an important. But it is actually an important date in that math. So yeah, tune in tomorrow for that. Yeah. So what are you doing though, outside of uh, giving a warm place for your for your outdoor cat to to sleep? Well, I'm. I live in a cabin in the woods, so it will really just mm -hmm. be me and my daughter. But we have a lovely day. Like, you know, I'll cook a turkey and they'll and Santa will come in the morning and there'll be lots of presents opened. And on Christmas Eve, of course, you can catch me here on Talking Weird. I almost said Mysterious Library. You can catch me with Chad <laughs> Lewis. So I'll be in the spirit then. And I love Christmas Eve. I love wrapping the presents. I love, mm -hmm. you know, having a cup of eggnog while I do it. I love all of those things. So, no, I'm really looking forward to Christmas. Yeah. Great. Speaking of, of uh, turkeys, so we were at Sam's over the weekend getting, uh, getting stuff, and they had a sale on these frozen smoked turkeys, right? It was a really good sale. Um, so we grabbed a couple of the smaller ones because that was a better deal. Anyway, these are, you know, pre-smoked turkeys, and I, I cannot tell you how good it is. Like, if you get a chance to get, like, smoked everything is good right? Just smoking everything is good. That can be taken many different ways. <laughs> um, 
I mean, specifically foods, right? I love me some smoked cheddar, but yeah, man, these, these turkeys were amazing. Like oh, just, wow. oh yeah. Like that's, that may be my new favorite thing. I'm like, can we go back and like get a dozen and then freeze them? Cause <laughs> man, they like the, like, dude, they were sm- like, it was, it was amazing. I'm, I, this is my new favorite thing. And I've got a smoker grill and that's actually one of the things I'm working on is properly smoking meats. Um, so I may have to try my hand at smoking a turkey in the future. Cause that's, that was some good stuff, man. Oh, wow. I'll have to get down to Texas and eat some of that turkey sometime. There you go. Sounds like a plan. But I hope you have a very Merry Christmas, my friend. And I hope all of our viewers and listeners and everybody at Untold Radio Network also has a, a beautiful Christmas. And again, like I said, don't let the pressure of the season get you down. Remember the meaning. And if you have, you know, if you are having a hard time, mm-hmm. just reach out to somebody. It's probably the best time of year to reach out to somebody. So Merry Christmas, everybody. Yes. And Merry Christmas to all. And to all, a good night.